Number 10, suck on a clove. Bad oral hygiene was not permitted back in ancient China. Bad breath, even less so. For example, if you were going to be seeing the emperor, it was required that you suck on a clove beforehand to make your breath all nice and fresh, just in case. I think I'm going to use that as an insult. I'm not going to say it again because I feel like, no. Yes, I like this. Other than breath fresheners, the ancient Chinese used primitive toothbrushes made of willow branches that were rinsed clean and then chewed to make all hairy and stuff. And then dipped in some of this tooth cleaning powder made of a bunch of different ingredients like pork teeth, saponin, ginger, cooked remina glutinosa, mulu, eclipta, lotus leaf, green salt, and other things I don't want to struggle to pronounce. Okay. Before that though, they would also use salty warm water as a mouthwash, which would make their teeth more firm and help clean them. I actually do this uh, like every once in a while after I brush my teeth too. It's actually really good for your gums. These ancient Chinese knew what was up. Number nine, bathing. In ancient China, the etiquette of a gentleman demanded that he wash his hands five times a day, take a bath every fifth day, and wash his hair every third day. Bathing every day was a bit of a superstitious no-no, started by northern Chinese societies that would actively avoid cold water or bathing in the winter to avoid getting a cold altogether. And not bathing at all was considered barbaric, like those pesky Mongols who hated bathing and who were hated by the Chinese. Honestly, that part is, is kind of fair. They, they, they kind of sucked. So yeah, to kind of reach a nice midpoint, the norm was to wash once every five days. But that was for the nobility. The common people had access to giant bathhouses where they would go, and I mean, they could go whenever they wanted, really. I shower every morning. I have heard that's bad, but I don't think I'd willingly go for like five days without washing, so I don't know. Maybe I gotta move it to every other day. I, somebody give me advice, please. Let's move on, I, let's just move on. Number eight, rice water. So, the Chinese washed like once a week. That's fine, but how did they wash? What did they use? Well, in the beginning, it was actually common to bathe using rice water as your go-to. It would be used as both body wash and shampoo. The rice water was really good at removing oil and keeping that hair and scalp nice and beautiful as well as keeping skin nice and silky smooth. The rice water also contains starch, protein, and vitamins that are really good for us. It helped with lower back pain, frostbite, and it was really good to help relieve some of the exhaustion after a long day. Most baths are good at that, honestly. The Chinese also used honey locust that was really good for eliminating dirt and treating rheumatism and ringworm. Both rice water and honey locusts were used for doing laundry as well, with honey locusts keeping clothes unfaded and in good condition. As far as ancient cultures go, the Chinese are already far ahead and we're only on the eighth point. Number seven, thirsty. After a trip to the public washrooms, you may need a drink of water to rehydrate yourself. I mean, come on, I know I could use some hydration after that. Sometimes it gets really sweaty in there. Well, it's a good thing that the Aztec cities had canals, and not just the kind of canals a small Italian gentleman derives a boat through on Valentine's Day, but canals that handled both transportation and irrigation. Aztecs knew just how important water was for life, but perhaps most unusual about the Aztecs is their night soil collectors, which honestly sounds like it's hiding something just in that name. Night soil. Basically, they were beta garbage collectors who used canoes to transport this night soil to farms for fertilizer. And yes, night soil is exactly what you think it is. Poop! But it's unusual for a civilization to be so conscious of where their waste goes. Don't believe me? Well, how about this summer? We all get together, we all go up to New York City and take a dip in the Hudson River. Yeah, not many takers, didn't think so. They were doing their best with what they had. And if women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. You know what I'm saying? Number six, ye olde dentistry. Look, every time I find a decent dentistry fact, I slap that bad boy in here like a D-based infomercial host with a surprisingly effective kitchen gadget. You're gonna love my nuts. Remember that guy? This is just one of those facts. Do I have a fear of the dentist? No. No, I don't, because my dentist is nice and has all the modern amenities to make me feel at ease. A comfy chair, laughing gas, and putting Peppa Pig on the TV because I'm a big baby. Goo goo gaga. However, no amount of any of those things I mentioned can prepare you for the dentistry before the year 1900. It was crude to say the least, but hygiene is hygiene, and you gotta keep that mouth fresh and clean. Tooth infections were fixed with rubbing charcoal in the affected area, and if that wasn't enough, a super safe mixture of snake venom and vinegar was used. 
What? I, okay. Who was the first guy that discovered snake venom had such healing properties? Probably the same weirdo who first milked a cow, if I had to guess. Aztec dentistry included fillings and tooth removal as well. Also, ladies of the evening dyed their teeth distinct colors, so then you'd know if you know. You know? Look at my red teeth, boys. Number five, moss. We're halfway through and I'll say it again. I'll remind you all again. I have the utmost respect for you ladies. As a guy doing this list and like writing this list, I mean the things you had to craft back then and then, you know, put, uh, oh my lord. For example, going back to the 10th century, this was a time long before Tampax was ever even a thing. Women were forced to get creative when it came to personal hygiene. They had to just figure it out themselves and literally collect grass, or moss, sheepskin lined with cotton. It was mostly moss all the time. You all are absolute troopers. If it wasn't moss, other solutions were small pieces of wood with lint wrapped around it. Number four, Q-tips. If you haven't heard, Q-tips are not for your ears. Yeah, I thought this was a rumor. Turns out we're all lawbreakers. I use two at the same time if I'm in a rush. No, flip them. I'm a vigilante when it comes to Q-tips. Q-tips were invented in 1923 by Leo Gertzenzang, right after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Kinda sounds like his wife invented Q-tips, but okay, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. It's like a Sweet Baby Rays, that barbecue sauce. Oh, so good. They just called it Sweet Rays. Maybe they gave it up to the baby, I don't know. You have to try and work it out. I don't know what the bit is, but I'm like, hey, that's a great sauce. And I just thought of that sauce. Baby Ray's Baby Gaze. Back in those days, Q-tips were dipped in boric acid and they were intended to sterilize wounds. Yeah, we're just out here like... <laughs> My eyes roll back every time. I get so, I get way too deep. I get too deep where I'm like, oh, it's gone. Huh, there it is, magic, I'm a magician. After this, there were even Q soaps, Q oils, Q creams. It's like Apple, like I, iPad, iPhone, the other eye stuff. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be in your ears, what's that about? Well in 2008, Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax into your ear canal, leading to possible infections more than anything. When Cheesebro Ponds bought the company back in 1962, they added a warning on the box. A warning that we, and I, gladly still ignore. Just talking about this, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go clean my stuff out. Mm. I have Q-tips in my bag, literally, I'm always prepared. Always strapped. Number three, hair removal trick. In the late 19th century, something called thallium actate started to sweep the nation. It was a hair removal method, which even today is the talk of the town. Laser off that peach fuzz for good. Zero, gone. Thallium was used back in the day, but originally thallium was prescribed for those who suffered with ringworm. But even so, thallium didn't do anything per se about the ringworm, it just caused the patient's hair to fall off. So the ringworm was then easier to find. I'd prefer a haircut if you ask me, but sure, thallium does the trick as well. Eventually, thallium was sold as a cream, a toxic cream. It should never touch your skin at all, and it's a face cream. Are you kidding? This thing was once rat poison as well, and now we're rubbing it around like it's Bath and Body Works Noel cream. It's my favorite cream, the green one. Oh God, gone in two days. This was outlawed, thankfully, in the 30s, but it had to get bad pretty first. Number two, Aqua Tofana. Going back to the 1600s for this one. Also, if you're a murderino, you'll enjoy this bit of dark history. Aqua Tofana was a cosmetic that was sold to women in the early 1630s. It was a cosmetic that doubled as a poison. Yeah, <laughs> sneaky, right? Some Assassin's Creed shit going on here. The origins of this deadly cosmetic that was sold and responsible for around like 600 deaths is pretty wild. So back in 1632, two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofana Diamato, they both created this poison. They worked together and created it so that when their husbands kissed them, on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. But eventually, Tiafana was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through her daughter, Yulia Tiafana. She took this deadly recipe to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and belladonna. Colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. And finally, coming in at number one, more ancient birth control. Okay, we kicked this list off catching up with ancient Egyptians and the uh, aid of acacia trees and all that jazz. So I figured we'd end on a ridiculous birth control method from the ancient Roman days. Serranus, who was known as a Greek gynecologist back then, his idea for Planned Parenthood was not a good one. It was not a good idea. He wrote that after you, you know, bump uglies, in order to prevent pregnancy, the woman must squat and sneeze. 
First of all, no, not a chance, no, no. And also, if you're thinking about it, no. Secondly, who can sneeze on demand? I certainly can't. I had a really nice time tonight, cheers. That's not, that's not possible, no. Many methods from the past are questionable. In ancient China, it was commonly told that drinking hot mercury could prevent pregnancy. Yeah, leave mercury away from your body, that will literally kill you. Ancient Greeks would drink blacksmith water because they too thought the exposure to lead could prevent getting pregnant. This idea came back around World War I as well. Women were working in factories and actually trying to get exposed to lead. That was the whole idea. Bad. These are pretty dark, so I'll leave you on this one. In the Dark Ages, European women wore amulets made of weasel testicles to magically ward off pregnancies. Poor weasels. Black magic is the worst, isn't it? Number 10, the forbidden toothpaste. If I looked into your bathroom right now, what would I see? Oh, uh, you forgot to flush the toilet. If it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. Seems you've forgotten your own golden rule there. What I was actually looking at was for a flavor of toothpaste that you had. Classic mint, maybe you got cinnamon. Maybe you go for the whole bamboo toothbrush charcoal toothpaste vibe. Hey, I respect it, good on you for making better choices, but bad on the Aztecs for making gross choices. Ever look at some forbidden lemonade and think, hey, add some salt to this, and now we got ourselves a bona fide toothpaste? Of course you didn't, because you ain't a crazy person. Or at least I hope you're not. But yeah, Aztecs used to brush their teeth with an unholy mixture of golden broth, pee, and salt. Yeah, I. why would you add salt to pee? I, I think it cleans teeth, sure. You just have to borrow an Egyptian breathman after. It's no big deal, it's fine. It's good for your teeth, it's fine. Number nine, high stakes. Any good game of a sport will have you at the edge of your seat and dropping all cheese flavored snacks around you just so you can keep your eyes glued to the screen. The Aztecs did not have access to such finger licking good things like Doritos, but what they did have was a sport that was very high stakes. Maybe too high actually. As if you didn't win, it could very well cost you your life. A game called, here we go, Chris is gonna like me pronouncing this, called Omalazitli. With its nine pound rubber ball and eye shaped court, players had to pass the ball through a small stone ring. This game was taken very seriously, like ritual serious, and you didn't want to be on the losing side, as it may cost you your head. Yes, even sports events in modern times have gotten violent, sure. But if we started lopping off heads for our losses, well, Tom Brady would have a lot more blood on his hands, wouldn't he? Number eight, hot chocolate. As a Canadian, I cannot tell you how important the medicinal qualities that are a hot chocolate on a wet, cold winter's day. You've been slipping and sliding down a snow hill for hours, and your snow pants are soaking wet, partially from the snow and also because your dad made you go down the super scary hill and it was too much for you. Don't tell mom. Hot chocolate was important for the Aztecs too, more so just chocolate actually. It was used for a number of things. First off, after the beans have been roasted, they smell amazing, so it most likely went into some perfumes and other lovely smelling things that they used. It was also used as currency, strangely enough, and it was also, 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 used as a ritual drink, except they didn't exactly have sugar, so they used other things, other ingredients like peppers and other unusual flavor enhancers. To, for chocolate, I don't, pepper, I, I never understood that. People are like, it's hot, like Mexican hot chocolate, it's, it's pepper and chocolate. It's a weird, hot, cho hot spicy chocolate. Not a, not a fan, not a fan. I'm saying, number seven, bad toothpaste. Doramad toothpaste was advertised in the 1920s. The ad shows a blonde lady with a lovely smile. Some would even say glowing. Right below reads Doramad radioactive toothpaste. Radioactive toothpaste, I've uh, hmm, that sounds bad. I've played enough Fallout to know that radioactive toothpaste probably isn't a great product, especially to put in and around your mouth. It even loudly advertises its radioactive ingredients. Can you imagine this? Increase the defense of teeth and gums. The cells are loaded with new life energy. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. That last one I made up, but you can't tell, right? How insane is this? This secret ingredient to shinier smiles and brighter futures was thorium. The god of thunder does not brush with thorium. He uses it to polish his hammer. Yeah, it's very toxic. Number six, Gorad's cream. Once advertised as a magic beautifier, doesn't that sound like a neat time? Gorad's oriental cream hit the market back in 1936. 
This cream was supposed to freshen up your skin, make you look lighter, younger, whatever Paul Rudd's doing, whatever his secret is, we're still trying to figure that one out. That sort of thing. But instead, this skin cream had one user ending up in a book that's very Chamber of Horrors style. This magic ingredient that was meant to magically make you beautiful had some magic mercury in it. Not something you want on your face, yeah, at all. The results were haunting. This woman had soon developed black gums. Her teeth loosened and dark rings appeared around her eyes and even her neck. Mercury poisoning is not fun. Number five, dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently. But why are we even doing it? Do we know other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth the first apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too. But back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she's the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short-lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way, safe way, to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you'd have to go back on it so you'd look hot. I don't know. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons just had to have this machine. I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick you ask? Radiation. They didn't know this yet. It was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x-ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there. No sheet, no metal heavy thing, just face to face. Now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what? At least you were hot. Sorry, gents, this isn't for you. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods. How in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know. How? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, ugh, what? Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows? Physicians believed it had antiseptic properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. Okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really, great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches, the early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they weren't invented 
until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, you feel yes? I don't want to be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up. Kicking off the list at number 10, Karem Lou. It's the 1930s, you're looking for a way to get rid of those upper lip hairs. Well, Karem Lou promises to have your back. They actually promise to have your armpits as well. Yeah, armpit hair and upper lip hair, gone. For good, you say? Wow, that sounds absolutely lovely. Just don't read the fine print, don't flip it and zoom in. Don't zoom in. This cream was applied to the upper lip, but side effects caused hair loss all over your body. And sometimes users would suffer from paralysis. It was on the market for $10, which back in the 1930s, that's a lot, a lot, a lot. Like for hair removal cream, that's a lot, a lot. Those are like Beats headphones, what is this? The Journal of the American Medical Association called this product out as viciously dangerous. Rightfully so, and those who suffered from those harsh side effects collectively sued the company into bankruptcy come 1932. The silent killer here in the cream was thallium, commonly used as rat poison. That ought to do it. Number nine, ancient birth control. Although birth control today is easier than in ancient times, it's still a chore. It's routine, it's something you have to keep track of daily, and things go wrong if you don't and lose track. There's a plethora of side effects. You have to take fake ones just so your body, what? Your hormones are all over the place. You can get cancer from these, you can get blood clots potentially. There's really, there's very little research on long-term effects for birth control pills. And also, I'm speaking not from experience. There's no birth control pill for guys. This is wildly unfair. I have the most respect. These pills mess you up. My friends will tell me their side effects, and I can't believe it. You're all troopers. Ancient Egyptians, their method of ancient birth control was by mixing acacia fruit with honey and ground dates. This paste would then be used directly, and believe it or not, it was rather effective. Acacia gum ferments and then turns into lactic acid, which can prevent pregnancy. Not all of these ancient methods worked like this. There's another that's really bizarre, and I'll save that for the end. It's absolutely insane, I can't believe it. We'll ease our way there, you know, we'll, we'll start nice. Number eight, Lash Lure. Turning the calendars back to 1933, the year FM radios and drive-in movie theaters were introduced and as well as the horrifying and deadly mascara, Lash Lure. This 1930s cosmetic contained a chemical P-phenylidamine. That's how you know it's bad, when you can't even pronounce the thing. This mascara left blisters all over your face, your eyelids, the whole thing, it was really bad. There was eventually a death in 1933. One woman sadly developed an infection, a bacterial infection, and then passed away. It was so bad that later that year, her before and after photos were used in an FDA display titled The Chamber of Horrors. It was a horrible incident, but a good way to get the attention from higher ups, so something like this never happens again. Lash Lure was then the first product in history that was removed from stores entirely, so it worked. We're in the middle of something kind of similar now, I think. Cigarette packages have those horrible side effects to smoking right there on the packaging. The girl with the face. Could we see the day smoking is outlawed? I don't know, I feel like we're close. It's caused quite a few more deaths than Lash Lure. That's all I Number seven, Corn Goddess. I like corn just as much as the next guy. Roasted, boiled, and on the cob. Slap some salted butter on that bad boy, whoo, it's time to dig in. Make sure you got the corn on the cob holders though. The little metal thingies that you'll probably end up stabbing yourself with later, that's just, that's just how it goes. Besides backyard summer barbecues, corn was an important staple of the Aztecs. So important that they had a festival to honor the corn goddess. Which to me is kind of a lame thing to be a god of, but alright, let's run with it. Zilonan Festival had the women let their hair loose and green corn placed in it to honor the god, the corn god. A forced female volunteer was dressed as the goddess and after many days of what I'm assuming is eating and worshipping corn, the forced volunteer was sacrificed by the people to once again honor the corn god. You'd think a bowl of corn would do the job, but no, nope, she's got a lust for blood so that means uh, off with the head. Number six, end times. We all know what ancient civilizations are like with predicting the future, or more specifically, predicting the end times. Mayans thought everything was going to fade to black in 2012. Didn't, did it. Some people really thought this was going to happen. I always thought that Buddy just didn't get around to finishing the thing, but hey, whatever works. Well, if it was real, why didn't the world end? Well, the Aztec answer to that was the new fire ceremony. Another ceremony, why not? 
Basically, every once in a while, things got a little crazy. It was a time to cleanse, a spring cleaning, if you will. People stopped working, destroyed household items, and at the end of a five day cycle, some priests would take a dude up a volcano and toss him in there like I toss away bad report cards from my mother. All this to prevent the end of the world. Virus, act of God, bad hygiene. Whatever it was, just good old fashioned blanket solution. <laughs> Number five, steam baths. Now looking back and learning that the Aztecs had public washrooms everywhere and had access to steam baths because of their irrigation is fantastic. I mean, come on, just think about it. You could relax after a long day in your own steam bath that's made by natural running water. It sounds like doing yoga there would make me feel more in touch with my inner chakras. And my mood crystals would glow just a little bit brighter. Imagine, you walk into a bathhouse after a long day, and then you see me just sitting there with a towel that barely fits. Well, hey there, good looking. Why don't you come on in and pop a squat next to me? I promise I don't hog all the steam. <laughs> I know it sounds like an amazing time, right? The more we talk about the Aztecs, the more they sound like a perfect society. I wonder what happened to them. I'm sure it was nothing bad. They gotta be out there somewhere. Move over, fellas. I'm coming in for the steam. The steam was thought to have healing properties and was connected to their spirituality. Women even gave birth in the steam rooms, which feels like a really sweaty time. I just, I don't know about that. There's a lot of sweat. Number four, Bath and Body Works. It's clear the Aztecs were just cleaner than the other civilizations of the past, and honestly, I'm here for it. There's only so much a guy can say about people being stinky in the past. I mean, really, the smell must have been horrible, especially down in the nether regions. My lady, I would like to have a child with you, but the fragrance that is coming from both of our undercarriages makes me want to get into my carriage and drive it into the nearest body of water. Yes. Aztecs were making soap like it was their day job, using various herbs and plants to create much nicer smells and perfumes. However, during the rainy months, Aztecs wouldn't wash or wash their clothes in penance. But I guess one month isn't so bad. Strangely enough, women wouldn't wash their faces when men went off to war. I'm not sure about that one, but hey, I'll take it. Gold star for staying clean, Aztecs. Gold star. Number three, Bath and Body Works part two. Okay, another scenario. You're in the sixth grade. You're sitting at a desk and listening to Mrs. Smith, and she's going over what today's art assignment is. As you begin to reach for your favorite shade of red crayon, an odor hits your nose. It's unlike anything you've ever smelled before, and it's coming from your armpit. Puberty induced body odor. Not to worry. Your buddy has a can of the finest spray deodorant there is. He hands you a black can that says Axe. You are now one of them. And you start showing up to school dances with a seafoam pink button up shirt with the collar popped and a Justin Bieber haircut with a hat on backwards. Yeah, that's right. All while drenched in a can of Axe's finest. Shark tooth necklace shows every girl in the room that you're a tough guy. God, those guys are the worst. Okay, no, the Aztecs didn't go that far, but they were aware of the horrors of the classroom BO and recommended a special bath prepared with lovely smelling aromas, which makes sense. Good smells go in, bad smells from your bum, they go out. However, there's two ingredients that make me question things. Apparently, no odor killing bath is complete without a fresh bone from a dog and a human. I'm just gonna leave that with you and think about how you'd feel with two bones floating in your bath. That's disgusting. Apparently, they had to be fresh, too. That's gross. Number two, the Aztec classic. I'm glad the Aztecs had better hygiene because for once, I don't get super queasy talking about the things people did. However, it wouldn't be a video about Aztecs if I didn't talk about their favorite pastime. Sacrifice. And honey, if they were giving out gold medals for it, the Aztecs would be record breakers. Sure, they weren't the only civilization to sacrifice people, but they did it with such theatrics. It would make my old theater teacher very proud. But unlike most civilizations, the Aztecs did this all the time. Whenever the calendar called for one, it was time for one. And if they ran out of people, they would go grocery shopping for more. Or actually just go to war and take people, which is not good. Just know that when a chief or a religious leader cuts the heart out of a man whilst alive for the entire city to see, he most likely had a clean cloth and water to wash his hands, making modern surgeons proud everywhere. Number one, the European bug. It's safe to say that Aztecs, while not as clean as people today, they were striving for better hygiene, more than any other civilization at the time, really. However, no amount of hand washing, sacrificing, or putting herbs in your bath can prepare them for the Spanish. Not just the swords and the guns and invading and such, no, I mean the sickness that Europeans brought with them. It's a plot similar to War of the Worlds, except the invaders brought all the nasties with them. No matter what the Aztecs did, it wasn't going to stop the waves of lovely things the Europeans brought over. 
Armpits are clean, but now they got black lungs. There's too many diseases to even name, there's a lot. Number 10, wash your hands. No, seriously, go, go wash your hands right now. When was the last time you washed those filthy nests? Go wash your hands. Washing your hands is super important, especially these days. But something that's very unusual about the Aztecs compared to a lot of other civilizations in history is that, well, they did wash their hands. Oh, and you have no idea how happy that makes me. No more shall I have to think about people shaking hands after using the bathroom with no toilet paper. That's disgusting. Or scooping food onto a plate with their bare, dirty hands and sharing that food with the rest of their families. Yes, the Aztecs like to wash their hands before and after a meal, which is just the way it should be. I hate having grimy hands. You know, I talked to the chief today, and you know what he said? That's it, that's actually it. Yeah, we like that, that's it. Number nine, Aztec Barbershop. It must have been quite the sight for Spanish conquistadors to land upon the shores of North America and then come to bear witness the Aztec civilization in all its glory. Something noticed by the curious Europeans was that the Aztecs had what looked like a barbershop for men. After all, a healthy scalp is a happy one. Even more interesting than that, however, is women were dyeing their hair with a green herb that I'm not even going to begin to pronounce. It was just too hard. It was a lot of X's and T's. I couldn't do it. Which produced a purple shine to their hair. Some women even shaved their hair off, while older women, like mothers, had longer hair. Man, it's almost as if a beautiful civilization was starting to flourish. Well, I'm sure nothing bad ever happens to the Aztecs, right? Number eight. My heroes. Let me create a scenario for you. I like creating scenarios. Let me create a scenario for you. You're on the way to a certain event that is very important in the big city. Maybe it's a new job, a new summer fling, or something that requires dry pants. But now your stomach is acting up. It's big angie. Your stomach's making sounds that are becoming more audible and you can feel soon you will require a bathroom. But you hold it in. I can make it past this event and then go, you say to yourself, no problem. But now you've got cramps, sweats, and you're getting anxious as you know that DEFCON 1 is approaching. You now have to make a decision to make a rush to find a bathroom or be late for your event or take a gamble with your underwear and dignity. Yes, that is a feeling I know all too well, but perhaps I should have been living in the Aztec Empire as they had public washrooms all over the city. That's just awesome. Oh, what sweet relief. As if that weren't the most unusual, they also had citizens cleaning the streets, which is pretty unusual for the time. Yes, cleanliness was very important to the Aztecs, and honestly, I think there should be public toilets on every street corner. Please, sometimes I gotta go. Number seven, threading. Bet you didn't know that hair was not really people's favorite thing in ancient China. I saw somewhere that they even referred to it as thread-like things of troubles. Why the hate? I don't know, but it was part of the reason monks would completely get rid of it. Other people would remove their hair too, and one way of doing that was the practice of threading. A form of hair removal that is still a thing we do today, actually. Now, I apologize if I mess this up, I've never had it done, but threading basically consists of a thin cotton or polyester thread that is doubled, then twisted, and then it's rolled over areas of unwanted hair, plucking the hair at the follicle level. In our modern day and age, it's typically used for eyebrows to shape them and keep them gorgeous. In ancient China, they would use threading to deal with facial hair, which, I mean, I guess eyebrows kind of count as facial hair, so. Threading isn't really opportune for arm or leg hair, though, so it's just a pure facial thing. Good to know. Number six, combs. Yeah, some people didn't like hair, but those who deal with it made sure to keep that stuff nice and combed. Combs were all the rage. A province of China even got the nickname of the home of combs, which is a great name. Whether they would be made of wood, stone, or animal bone, many combs were made with care and craftsmanship. Comb shops would open up all over the show and people would carry combs as accessories. They'd come in all sizes. Get yourself a comb for the weekends, a large comb to get all your hair at once, a comb to hold your hair in place. Heck, get a comb to help weed out those pesky lice. Nice. Number five, bread and entertainment. Hygiene is health, and health is mental health. And that means after a long day, you need entertainment. 
That's why you came here, hopefully. They say that after bread comes entertainment. I feel the same. Where would my generation be if not for the ability to rewatch The Office infinitely? Aztecs have been theatrical killers, sure, but they also had a soft spot for the arts. During their crazy spring cleaning festival to save the world, you may just find the Aztecs enjoying music and poetry. Some of the poetry even survived the downfall of the Aztecs and is around today. I'd recite it, but I would need some help from Chris to help sound things out. I wonder if they had a poem for a stranger that comes from a faraway land to take all our golden riches away. Hmm. Number 4. More than one way to skin a cat. Here I am talking about Aztecs, and that means I gotta talk about how bloodthirsty they were. Seriously, it's good they washed their hands because with the amount of blood on them, well, I don't have a joke for that, they just kinda got crazy with it. It's estimated that 20,000 people a year perish to sacrifice. That's that's way too many, dude. That's that's wrong. Which, if I'm being honest, those numbers probably could've helped you fight off the Spanish when they, they came to take everything. What do I know? Cutting the heart out of people while they were still alive, a lot of heads no longer attached to bodies, and something that's just so heinous. Texas Chainsaw fans rejoice, because the Aztecs loved a good skinning. Just a good old fashioned peel skin off them. Just take it off, George. George, take your skin off. I don't know why Jerry Jerry Seinfeld skinning somebody, but sure. What do they do with the skins afterward? Do they throw them into the crowd and they cheer it on? Because that's, that, that's just wrong, man. That's not right. That's wrong, bruv. The chief was so upset by this one that he had nothing to say, actually. The chief is speechless. He's got nothing. Number three, multiple wives. The act of doing the deed in the bedroom can be messy sometimes. It happens, a lot of passion. And keeping that area on your body and in your life clean is important. Or so says my sixth grade health teacher. I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. But you gotta think back in the day how sometimes keeping that area fresh it was difficult, especially because we have no self-control and we went a little crazy with it. Take for example that having multiple wives was a status symbol. And let me tell you something, they weren't sitting around waiting for the new season of Stranger Things. They were doing as they do on the Discovery Channel. Number two, get your money right. Any good accountant will tell you that treating your portfolio like good hygiene is a good idea. Go for multiple smells or invest in multiple things. Check out what's on the market. Might be a new perfume, maybe a new stock. And while you're at it, dump a huge investment into fart bucks. Okay, well maybe not that accountant, but believe it or not, the Aztecs were great accountants and had good records of pretty much everything, which is unusual because most cultures in Mesoamerica just just didn't. And with the amount of gold and riches that the Aztecs had accumulated over time, it was kind of necessary. So you can understand that when the Spanish showed up, they were salivating at the sight of all the treasure that did not belong to them because Hernan Cortez was going to take it. Hand it over, you nice smelling weirdos. Number one, wiped out, dude. Through everything the Aztecs went through or did, it all came down to a fever uh, and a cough and many other symptoms, actually. All of their triumphs and losses, all their sacrifices, and all the times they tried to fend off the Spanish. Futile compared to their fight against the sicknesses the Spanish had brought over. Once there was a patient zero, it was pretty much all over. As good as their roots and medical herbs were at healing, ain't nothing gonna cure that black lung. If it can do what it did to a big handsome cowboy, then it can do the same to everyday people. <laughs> Dutch, <laughs> we got the Aztec sick again, Dutch. <laughs> I got some chocolate though. Hope you like corn in your chocolate, Dutch. <laughs> Kicking off the list at number 10. Hot topics. Over in Finland, they're changing the game. The sauna over there is considered a national institution. It's a large part of both Finnish and Estonian cultures. These saunas are commonly found surrounding Finland's lakes, corporate headquarters, and, oh yeah, of course, the parliament house. Saturday in Finland is traditional sauna day. It's not Saturday for the boys, it's just Saturday and we're gonna, we're gonna breathe in each other's mouths for a bit. I can't even fit into a bathtub. I look like an octopus trying to escape a jar. It's not relaxing, it's not a good Saturday at all. I wanna move to Finland. When government leaders can't agree on an issue, they take it to the sauna. How amazing does that sound? In the middle of passing a bill, dudes will just pause and then go hit the sauna. We need this over here. Finns describe the sauna as a secret weapon behind their diplomatic advances. Director of the Finnish Employers Confederation described the ritual saying that it's easier to discuss problems openly. It's like when we're doing a presentation in class, they always say to imagine everybody naked. Well, this was just that scenario played out in real life. Take away the briefcase and tie, you're just a naked dude sitting on a bench talking about inflation. Kind of an odd picture when you think of it. Number nine, the outhouse. 
One thing I am glad I don't have to deal with anymore is outhouses. Not that I ever did, it's just something I don't want to do. I called the chief again last night and uh, he said it wasn't it, again. Outhouses have been around for a long time. Technically just a hole in the ground where the business is done. It wasn't until later a small wood shack was built around said hole. And then it became an outhouse. Because the design of the outhouse is quite simple, there is a few design flaws that really just don't make any sense. Okay, yeah, it had to be built away from the house, as it is a pit full of refuse that exit a human being. But it's also built away from your house. So if you gotta go bad, I mean, you gotta go bad. You might not make it. This also is not so fun if you live in a place where it's cold and you have to dress just to take a leak. But really what is the craziest thing is that after a certain time, that hole is going to fill up with an unholy godliness I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And now you gotta move it somewhere else. I know they wouldn't fill up that fast, but after a few years living in the same place, there'd be a few holes everywhere and that's, that's just not good decoration, is it? Not to mention, if you were living in the time of the expanding west, an unseen rattlesnake or scorpion could make the potty time your last. I'll just stay indoors, thanks. Number eight, there's not advising for that. Does anybody else sneeze when they look at the sun, or is that just me? Do I have issues? I have a handful of allergies, and one of them apparently is a star. That's neat. My eyes are literally always dry. I think I forget to blink. I'm not really sure what's going on. But today, there's a visee, luckily, for everything. Eye drops are common, but written in the oldest book of medicine, the Everest Papyrus, chock full of ancient Egyptian medical recipes, it contained old optical treatment. Even in Egyptian artwork, you can find ancient cataract treatments. British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard found these clay tablets from ancient Babylonia around 625 BC, and treatment for dry eyes was a little different than today. Today, all you have to do is and you're good. Back then, you had to get chemicals from plants and then mix them with prayers. Good game, good luck. One ancient tablet described the treatment of the time saying, if a man's eyes are affected with dryness, he shall rub an onion and then drink a beer and then apply oil to his eyes. Just mix all that sh put it in your mouth, and then thou shalt disembowel a yellow frog mix in its gall and curd and apply it to its eyes. I don't even know what the f that means. Like imagine getting that on a prescription, you're like a yellow frog, what? Number seven, loincloths. Okay, I have to adjust the jeans for this one. Going back to ancient Roman and ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Neat. Either that or you would just be naked. So, you know, if you're a nudist, great. Hit the thumbs up if you're a nudist. I don't know, I don't know why I said that. We're gonna keep going. I found this neat step-by-step -step on the internet how to make your own loincloth. And it's a bit more complicated than throwing on sweatshorts and calling it a day. We don't have a lot of archeological evidence today because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather also to make underwear, which is, just imagine that. I'm like, ha, it's hot. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but We'll save that talk for another time. Number six, breast bags. There's a neat term, breast bags. Let's bring that one back, see if it sticks. Now, contrary to what I just explained over at point number seven, women, more often than not, didn't wear undergarments in the Middle Ages, up here at least. But in 2008, at Austria's Langburn Castle, something that resembled a modern day bra was discovered. It's believed that only higher ups, ladies of nobility rather, were the only ones who had the privilege to wear these breast bags or breast cups. I say breast bags, sounds a little funnier. We have bags of milk in Canada, so you know, I'm connecting the, yeah, that's, that's, I gotta connect the jokes. I can't say much personally, but this does not look supportive enough at all. It's like a pirate flag, it's like ripped apart, this is nothing. If you have back problems, I don't think these breast bags are gonna help you. If you're ever catching up on some 13th century readings, well, now you have an image when you see the word breast bag. This, this eye patch that they called support. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and also ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step online on how to make your own loincloth, because that's apparently what I do on my free time. Thank you for asking. And it's a bit more complicated than I thought. It's way more, it's way more complicated than just throwing on sweatpants or even, you know, the towel fold like a toga. This had numerous steps. We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather to make underwear. That's a fun little fact right there. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the hot sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but I'll let Adam tell you about that one another time. That's more of a, that's more of a home one. Number four, food as medicine. Trying to prevent bad things before they happen, it is a very human skill to have. And when it comes to preventative medicine, the Egyptians had some methods. One more obvious solution is diet. 
eating the right stuff truly does help lead to a longer life, but eating the specific right stuff can directly prevent certain issues. As a prime example, the laborers that would build the massive iconic structures we know Egypt for today were kept fed with diets that include a lot of onion, garlic, and radishes. Now, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians knew the chemicals these foods contained, or if they just put two and two together, but onions, garlic, and radishes contain ad why did I do this to myself? Contain allostatin, allicin, and raffinin which are very helpful when it comes to preventing diseases in the super crowded working and living conditions the laborers existed in. That Allison really helps. Another example would be to cure night blindness. In these circumstances, doctors fed their patients powdered liver, which is rich in vitamin A, which is a vital nutrient for vision. Again, I don't know if they knew it contained that specific fang or if they were just like, hmm, I eat liver and I can see better. Discovery! Number three, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with an interesting method to getting rid of those pimples. Now, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, and physicians back then discussed pimples as such. Ready for this? They called them these elevated spots, with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing said spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were referred to as maggots. That's what they thought they were back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots, thanks. No, no thank you, that's pretty horrible, that's a horrible reference. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. I would faint, I would be so sick. If a physician told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses anywhere on my body, I would throw up, I'd pass out, I'd be so upset. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, you have common acne, mm, maybe you're turning into a pigeon, who knows? Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds all to get rid of acne. Yeah, sounds like a horrible alternative. I would much rather just have acne. Maggots? Dude, I'm done with this channel. I'm out of here. That's so gross. Number two, eye makeup. Almost everybody and their mums knows that the Egyptians wore that crazy awesome eye makeup. But what you might not know is that it didn't just serve the purpose of making you look absolutely stunning. No, a lot of these eye makeups were lead based. Now, that sounds pretty bad, I can't lie. It does, and it likely was for some, but it was possible that it boosted nitric oxide by up to 240% in cultured human skin cells. I don't know what cultured human skin cells means, but that's the quote. If you know, let me know down below. What the heck does nitric oxide do? Well, that I do know. It helps to boost up your immune system to fight diseases, which, guess what? That's pretty important especially in the marshy areas around the Nile, where eye infections are actually pretty darn common. What's cool is that research suggests the Egyptians actually knew that, and specifically synthesized the makeup for this purpose. Huh, <laughs> neat. Finally, number one, mummification. Back in the day, mummification was common, and even today we're finding more mummies. Like, literally last month, we just unraveled six more. It's crazy. We're uncovering more ancient history, which is great, but how exactly was this process done? We're talking about back maggots and stuff. What, what did they think about this? How did this even begin a, to be a thing? Well, it wasn't cheap for starters. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's a pretty brutal process as well. What you would do is you would put a hook, or well, they would put a hook in your nose after you'd passed away, and then they would pull out your brain and all that just squishy stuff, just out all through this thing right here. And then they would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all those goods, all the organs, boom, see ya, gone. And while those are drying, you would put your lungs and liver in jars. And then you would put the heart back in the body. And then you would wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that stuff, turpentine, turpentines, all the time and teens, just all in there washing it out. Then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days. That's a long time. But around day 40, you would stuff it with sand. Now come day 70, finally, that's when you wrap them in the mummy bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits forever, really. And then there's just jars of organs also stored in your burial chamber. Now it's, we don't do it, it's not as fun anymore. We don't put our organs in jars. We don't stuff anyone with sand. We should, you know what? We should bring I back mummies. Let's just do should. it. I think it's time. Yeah. Kicking off the list at number 10, pig toilets. Yeah, we'll start off with a nasty one. Look, we're on the part six now. We're talking about some ancient hygiene practices. It's gonna get gross. It just has to at this point. I've talked about Roman toilets, horsehair dental floss, 
So now we gotta dive into some yucky stuff. Pig toilets began around 200 BC in China and these pig toilets were actually pretty common. You would just go to the washroom over top of a pig pen. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty awful, but also it's all they had. It's pretty awful, but I would say it's worse for the pigs. Definitely worse for the pigs. The pigs would eat the waste because it was mixed into their food. They couldn't tell the difference. Ugh, horrible. This was one of the few options to manage waste, especially in areas where plumbing wasn't possible. I talked about pigs going to court in your recent Bumblebee video. If I was a pig, I would be pressing charges left, right, and center after this. That's so disgusting. We're at number 10 and I wanna puke. Nice, buckle up. Number nine, water closets. This one sounds fun, a closet full of water. What a blast, pun intended. Back in the 1800s, all over Europe, our modern day version of the bathroom came to life. Thankfully, I'm very glad this happened. If it didn't happen, it'd be, it'd be a little bit different nowadays. It takes two things to have a water closet, a home big enough for a room purely devoted to waste, which is amazing, and of course, running water, that definitely helps. Sir John Harrington, godson to Queen Elizabeth I, was determined to invent what we now know as the basic toilet. Back in 1596, he created this idea, and people actually made fun of this guy for spending so much time working on a useless device. Yeah. The more we know. Cut to 200 years later, another inventor by the name of Alexander Cummings reworked the water closet, added an S trap, the little valve between the top and the bottom parts of the bowl, and now we're on the right track. Then a couple years later, in 1777, Samuel Prosser applied for a plunger closet patent and got it. A year later after that, Joseph Brama enters the toilet game, adds a valve on the bottom, an old school ball cock. So we're getting there, slowly over time. Different inventors are bringing their new ideas in, all so that we can go and take a Brahman was a sailor at the time, so his water closet was often used on ships of that era. Today we have toilets that flush automatically. Once you get up or move around, the sensors think you're done, and then they blast away. If you stand and wipe, good game. This thing's gonna be making noise all day long. Number eight. Bald face. In another video on things too woke for this era, I talked about how it was once cool to have no hair on your face at all. I can't grow any facial hair, so this is this reaches out to me. This is good, I like this. I like punching in on this fact. Well, Queen Elizabeth I was the first to bring this idea into Western culture. She influenced women to completely pluck their eyebrows, and on top of that, they would also shave their hairline back as far as they could, so their faces would be as large and as big and bright as possible, just right there, like the big moon, just it was common for women to soak bandages in a mix of ammonia, vinegar, walnut oil, all to hopefully, hopefully suppress the hair growth on their forehead. Facial hair was removed, but body hair, that was left untouched. The Catholic Church also influenced the look. Growing your hair out was a feminine display until you went out in public and had long hair. Then it was immodest. Because, of course. Number seven. One night with Venus, two years with Mercury. It wasn't too long after humans discovered toe curling that as much fun as that may be, there can be some unfortunate side effects. Knowing somebody in the biblical sense can transmit not so fun diseases if you catch my drift. Like syphilis, early stages being sores and uncomfortable rashes, late stages having much more serious side effects like blindness, heart disease, and oh yeah, it can make you go crazy. So throughout history, and especially before there was antibiotics, how do you treat a disease so common amongst people participating in the devil's dance? Liquid mercury, yeah. People try to treat a disease by consuming liquid mercury. When applied to the skin, it burned. Therefore, if it hurts, it works. It was noted that syphilis would go away after mercury treatments, but this could have just been a stage of the bedroom rodeo disease as its symptoms disappear right before things get bad. This is also assuming that people taking mercury aren't getting sick of mercury poisoning in the first place. This practice continued way longer than it should have as it wasn't until discoveries made in the 1900s that a better option for treating the brothel related illness. Honestly, with this kind of logic, anything's possible. Sky's the limit when you're crazy. Number six, the great stink of 1858. It's one thing living through a pandemic, but at least we're not living through something called the Great Stink. Yeah, the Great Stink of 1858. Who was responsible for this? What did you eat? What happened? Well, this was an event in central London and it lasted for a few months in the summertime too, which is just great for great stinks. It was so hot and dry that the Thames dried up, leaving just sewage, just all that gross you can imagine. The smell was so bad, Parliament had to close for an entire day. I wanna know who the first guy was to be like, you know what, nah, I'm going home. This sucks, this sucks. Good call. In order to continue work, Parliament had to soak the curtains on the riverside of the building in lime chloride just so they wouldn't be sick. They had to soak it in chloride to be like, that's better, it's better, we think. 
They were on the verge of moving their entire operation to Oxford. That's how bad it was. Members of the committee were quitting their jobs. While this sounds all bad, hundreds of tons of limes were being discharged into sewers to help the smell. So if you had a stuffy nose in July 1858, you could have made 1,500 pounds a week just messing around with limes. You missed your shot. Number five, bacon products. Who doesn't love bacon, right? Bacon is delicious. Bacon is a delicious meat that can be enjoyed for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Personally, there was nothing like waking up on a Saturday morning as a kid to play some GameCube and eat bacon and eggs, my favorite. I was a tubby kid and I was easy to impress. However, while bacon may not be the king of the breakfast table, it is the bootleg flavor of fragrance and the non-food market. It seems every time there's a store, gift shop, or novelties being sold, a bacon flavored, scented, or themed product is there for men. And it's not far behind. Because yes, we are tough and rugged. And we eat meat because we're cowboys. So that also means we want breath mints that are artificially bacon flavored, right? No, we don't. They taste horrible. It's awful. No one wants that. Nobody wants that. Number four, bath bomb. Call it genius marketing, crazy society, or people wasting money, but a lot of hygiene beauty products that women purchase, men do too. They just gotta repackage it and inject it with 300 cc's of testosterone because men. Take the hand grenade bath bomb for instance, taking bath bomb to a whole other level. Yes, the one I saw while researching was very colorful and it looked like it had a fruity scent, but it was shaped like a hand grenade from the second world war. No way an adult man would fall for that, right? Pfft, no. Chris, you see my rubber ducky? Number three, the man bun. Honestly, I don't mind this trend. I actually think it looks good. Certainly better than the mullets of the 90s. There's no way you can tell me mullets look better than man buns. You just can't. The man buns are actually somewhat organized. Especially if dudes grow them out and maintain them. However, what is strange to me is the man bun add-on. Yeah, it's like a man bun extension. You just like a clip-on. Basically, look like the guy who plays Wonderwall at every party for the low, low price of $19.99. I can't be dissing too much, though, because I wore a clip-on tie to the ninth grade. But the girls thought I was cute? I think? I think so. Number two, gendered products. Another broad stroke here, but when things get placed into categories, there's always two colors that get used. Pink for girls, blue for boys. While I'm not sure whether colors are actually masculine or feminine themselves, it has been hardwired into most of us, that's just how it goes. Anything plastered in blue or male-like imagery, it's what's meant for men. I, however, as a kid, had an absolute five-head play. To protect my valuables from thieves and villains in the night, I always chose something that was girl-themed, pink, or something a boy wouldn't pick, as I thought if presented with my stolen items, I could always identify them since only a boy would choose girly stuff. From my Nintendo DS to my notebooks and honestly everything in between. I, hot pink was in and Chetty made it work. I thought the plan was foolproof. I, I never really thought though what would happen if a girl took my stuff though. That, that, that didn't, I didn't really think that wouldn't work for that, would it? No, it wouldn't. Number one, wine in a can. This one is just so silly to me, and for any wine connoisseurs out there, take this with a grain of salt. I'm no sommelier, but I enjoyed the odd glass of wine, even if it comes from a box. I always thought the wine glass was elegant, higher class, but that doesn't mean you have to be higher class to drink it, or be less masculine. Well, now there's wine in a can for men, because we can't have flimsy glasses. We'll break those glasses because we're so strong. Oh, yeah. I just can't imagine wine in a can tasting good. It has to be worse than wine in a box, right? Uh, let me know in the comments, guys. I'm curious, what do you like to drink? Let Chetty know, I'm, I'm curious, I'd love to hear. Number 10, no lice. You know in elementary school when they would check everyone for lice and one poor sucker had to get their head shaved and walk around as that bald kid for like a month and would probably get bullied? Well that ain't gonna happen back in ancient Egypt because everyone shaved their heads to avoid lice back then and priests would shave their whole bodies just like Michael Phelps. Instead of having actual hair of their own they would wear wigs. Wigs sometimes made of human hair. That honestly was a lot better in that harsh desert sun. Lice and other little pests like that, like fleas, were not wanted. And yeah, they still aren't. But it led to some honestly interesting solutions. For example, a warm potion of date meal and water was believed to drive away fleas and lice. They would use cat's fat to keep away mice, I made a rhyme, and one that probably actually did something was when they used a solution of natron water and salt in their humble abodes to eliminate and repel fleas. Number nine, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day, all night, and feel like I'm about to faint, obviously. 
Canada gets quite hot. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? What was their trick? They didn't have banana breeze, FPF, SPF 90, whatever the hell it is. Ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty, right? You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Think again, Laura. Their routine was written on tomb walls and scrolls. Rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol was used to block the sun off. Yeah, it was that hard. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. And ancient Greeks as well, they used olive oil as sunscreen as well as ancient Egyptians. Which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You'd be burnt and extremely dehydrated, but also you'd have some nice tan lines and you wouldn't be as pale as me, so it wasn't all bad. Number eight, the finest of cosmetics. The cosmetics of ancient Egypt were not just for looking good, they were for feeling good too. Like on the inside. Now, as such, those professionals who made the stuff took it pretty seriously. Not just because of a passion for the art, but also because they'd be judged pretty damn harshly if they did a bad job. If they sucked, it would mean having the whole neighborhood give you a bad reputation. And in the cosmetics business, just like show business, it's all about that reputation. It would also mean some harsh judgment from the big boys upstairs meaning the gods when you met the afterlife. So yeah, they wanted to do a good job. And to meet that end, they would try and use the finest of ingredients, as they should when people have to put this stuff on their skins and right next to their eyes and stuff. Number seven, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was born, what did people even do to smell good? What, I don't, what happened? Deodorant was actually first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide. It was stored in a metal container, nothing like speed stick at all. It wasn't discreet or anything. It was bad, but ancient Egyptians, Eh, even worse. They had to use ostrich eggs when it came to smelling good in the pits. They made perfumes as well and were among the first to use any type of deodorant. So that's that's a pretty good start. Thank you. Thank you so much, ancient Egyptians. Hence the ostrich egg factor. They had to start somewhere. They mixed a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shell, and then nuts, and bam, there you go. You're ready for the day. Just pop it on. Another method was a little more yummy than the ostrich eggs and nuts method. Egyptians would use porridge balls. Yeah, flavored porridge rolled up and securely tucked under your arms. Honestly, that seems like a better alternative. Sometimes when you put antiperspirants or like deodorant on, it gets like all, it all crumbles apart. It's like feta cheese all of a sudden. You're like, what happened to this stick? I want, I would rather have porridge balls than just call it a day, boom. Number six, get this man a Tic Tac or something. Just like I use mints to cure my nasty tea breath, which I argue is worse than coffee breath, the ancient Egyptians used breath mints to keep things fresh. Honestly, they actually sound kinda good. Frankincense, cinnamon, melon, pine seeds and cashews put together, ground up and bound together in candy using honey. <laughs> Just heat that bad boy over the fire and let it cool and boom, breath mints. I like it, I like it a lot. These breath mints would be made commercially by those fine cosmeticians and dentists, or they could even be made at home. Some archaeological finds of bowls, jars, and other dishes suggest that they may have been candy dishes that would hold the lovely taste in little suckers. Always gotta keep things fun, fresh, and flirty back in ancient Egypt. Breath mints would certainly help you do the trick. <laughs> nice. Number five, cesspools. Ooh, gross transition. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where to build certain rooms. Like say over a cesspool, for an example, that might be important. Plug your nose. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, because you know, you, you poop and then you gravity and everything goes down. But you need to make sure that those floors are supportive enough. Because in 1183, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt, but the floor in the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through the floor, with a few of them even drowning in that cesspool. What a horrible way to go. Then again, in 1326 England, Richard the Raker had just sat down for dinner, guy hasn't even started his meal yet, and then again, the floor broke and he fell through and drowned. I'd say chamber pots were safer, definitely, but when it comes to waste, honestly, just out of sight, out of mind. Just get that away from me. Literally, pun intended. Number four, towels. I'm pretty picky when it comes to towels. I always have to have way too many just ready to go at all times. You know, in case I want a bath, in case I want to have two baths in a row, you never know. Today we have nicer towels at hotels than anything, honestly. We all know somebody with a Bahia Principe resort towel in their closet, and you're like, really? Really, you thief? Okay, I'm telling. Around the 1800s, flour sack towels were the best you'd get. Now, around this time, suppliers were packaging flour and other foods in these cotton sacks. This saved big time on barrels, and eventually they were cut into tea towels. Now, come the Great Depression, resources were of course limited, so these flour sacks were used now for multiple reasons. Clothing, toys, quilts, pillowcases, diapers, and of course, towels. 
when it feels too good on your back, not at all. Number three, same clothes, new day. King James, and no, I don't mean LeBron. I mean King James VI of Scotland this time around. We'll talk about him another time. He had a pretty sweet idea when it came to changing clothes. You don't, simple as that. What a dream, right? The amount of times I change my shirt every day for literally no reason, it's such a waste of time. It's like black, mm, gray, mm, black. Yeah, that's it. It's a waste of time. King James would wear the same clothes for months at a time, even wearing the same hat for 24 hours straight. He was devoted to the hat game. He just slept like, didn't move a muscle. He went as far as not bathing either because he thought that it was bad for his health. Yeah, things were thought differently back then, as you may have known by now on this channel. James became king when he was just 13 months old and he succeeded Mary, Queen of Scots. In 1603, he took over as ruler for both England, Scotland, and Ireland for 22 years. And he looked the same every day. Gotta, gotta love it. Who's committed? Number two, unwanted hair. Pubic hair is a biological mystery, and yes, even after we hit puberty, we still can't figure it out. What are you? What's going on? So far, we believe this is part of our evolutionary history, and it comes from a time where we needed fur all over our bodies, right? Like animals. We evolved to protect ourselves against the cold, and just in general to keep that area, you know, safe. I don't know why I did that sound, but it's safe. So why is it that ancient Greek statues of women are completely hairless? Well, this was a time where if a woman's area was hair free, for some reason, the Greeks symbolized it as being pure. Okay. So in order to be considered pure, you'd have to use razors and creams, pumice stones, methods that were not as smooth as today. What's even more annoying is that men who would grow their body hair out, that was a sign of maturing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not either of these categories. I can't grow anywhere where I want to. It's just bald, I'm just a bar of soap. Yeah, I'm not gonna use a stone to shave either. Thanks, we'll pass, next. And finally, coming in at number one, acne. Ancient Egyptians and Greeks came up with an interesting method of getting rid of those pimples. Now, reminder, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing. You ever click one of those videos and you're watching for like 40 minutes? You're like, I'm gonna be sick, is that yogurt? What is that? Physicians back then discussed these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing these mysterious spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then, so that's pretty horrible, that's gonna be in my head forever. They would refer to severe cases as maggots that lie in bed of roses, AKA your face, that's the bed of roses. If a physician told me I had maggots in my face, I'd faint. Teeth worms and maggots, like just brush your teeth and wash your face and then avoid all that smoke. These disorders were thought to be human skin taken on the properties of animals, so that's pretty wild. So ancient Greeks and Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds to solve that problem. Or what I just do is I just squeeze really hard, yell one curse word, and then wipe the mirror. That's usually how I do it. Number 10, the switchblade comb. A leather jacket, smacking jukeboxes, and a switchblade knife. Nobody was cooler than the Fonz on Happy Days. Well, maybe your uncle. Everybody has a cool uncle. But something I just think is silly, or something a lot of men probably use today, or at least the super cool guys who have no idea what or who the Fonz is, the switchblade comb. Basically, it's the same thing as a switchblade, but instead of a small blade, you got something to comb your hair with. Because when you're a man, you have to look fresh and tough at the same time. Trust me, ladies, it's, it's how we operate. Gotta look tough, gotta look mean. And kick the jukebox, Hey. Number nine, the ball jacuzzi. I don't know about you guys, but there is nothing better than a nice hot tub. I'd like to say I spend a lot of time in hot tubs with cute girls. However, due to my financial situation, however, most of the hot tubbing that I've done has been at public pools where I shared a hot tub with older Italian and Greek men who I swear were still wearing sweaters, but that was just their hair. Speaking of hair and saggy skin, meet the Tescuzzi, a tiny hot tub for the Pisha deal and two matzo balls. Hey, I understand, your undercarriage has to stay clean and honestly, I would love one. Chris and I were talking about we want one, we might even share one. Who knows? Number eight, the all-in-one. All right, man, this one goes out to us. The manly men, the dads, the sons, the brothers. The men who work all day and night and still have time for their family. I appreciate you and I see you, brother. Want to know why we have so much time, ladies? Well, that's because we've cut back on time in the shower with a very five-head invention. We call it body wash or face wash. Or shampoo, because we use it for everything. Three in one, yes, that's right. If we buy a body wash product, that means it will be used all over our bodies. No time for L'Oreal Pantene, or that purple shampoo with the kangaroo. We speed run shower so we can get back into doing the things that you ladies love. Like not putting the toilet seat down. 
Number seven, king of the porcelain throne. Kings, I hear you. Life can be busy, and the shower speed run is not the only product that we've invented. Here's another shout out to all my kings who take extra time while sitting upon the porcelain throne. I salute you. Yes, that's right. Besides doing the hygienic process of evacuating one's bowels, we take a mental health break in the bathroom. A time to check in, relax, take inventory, and take a breath of some not so fresh air. Especially if you ate Taco Bell the night before. Is it strange to sit there in that situation? Perhaps. But like any other guru, we need a space to feel our spirituality. Would Yoda be Yoda if he didn't meditate? Mmm, sit on the toilet, I will. Number six, the beard apron. This is just so smart, and I'm seriously considering buying one because this is the bane of my existence. Sometimes the lumberjack look is too much for me, and the closer I get to looking like Chris Farley, the better. I think I have a great motivational speaker impression. Maybe I'll show you guys one day. We'll see, I don't know. However, when shaving my beard, I have nowhere to go, and it's too cold in the winter to do it outside, so. That's why this is so smart. Basically, it's an apron that you post up like a hammock. So when you're shaving down those chiseled cheekbones of yours, all the little hairs fall into the apron. That way your GF can't yell at you because there's no mess to be made. Necessity truly is the mother of all invention. Number five, the human fly trap. This is honestly so five head, a brilliant play. Might be one of the best moves I've ever seen. Have you ever been to a picnic with a nice sandwich, some fresh crisp potato chips, and an ice cold lemonade as you sit on a warm blanket, enjoying the view just over yonder. When all of a sudden you are attacked by a swarm of bugs that just ruin the vibes. And now you don't even want the sandwich. Who made this lemonade? It's so bitter. I don't even like chips. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt felt the same way, except they had a great way to deal with it. Simply take a few of my servants and slather them in honey. Place them away from our royal picnic and bada bing, bada boom, you got no more flies bothering you or your sandwich. This honestly sounds completely cruel, and at a time when hygiene in general wasn't great, how did they get all that honey off? Sure, a dip in the Nile will get rid of most of it, but you'd probably just glaze yourself for a crocodile's lunch. Honey will get stuck in places where the sun don't shine. And just like shame, you can never really wash it off. Number four, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over, honey. I burn so easily. I have freckles for two days, then the rest is just red and un just bad, all bad. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? They didn't have Banana Breeze SPF 35. What did they do? Well, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Yeah, buckle up. Their routine was written on a tomb wall and also scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol and that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. To some chick named Jasmine, she was like, don't look at it, just stop. Ancient Greeks used olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, did absolutely next to nothing. You'd be burnt and dehydrated, but you know what? Tan line, so. Number three, Red Dead Bandage. America, 1864. There's a polite disagreement between North and South whether the South should be still using YouTube's least favorite S word as a business practice. The verdict? It wasn't very nice. That aside, the Southern states fought hard for a very stupid reason. Idiots. Such a hard fight in the fact that it was taking a serious toll on everyone. Specifically, the southern economy and civilians who got caught in the raw end of the deal. The war was a huge cost of life and money for both sides, but the south just didn't have the same resources the north did. So, after years of fighting, things weren't looking too good. An example of this was the south washing and reusing bandages as supplies were low and casualties were high. This might be hard to stomach, but that's just what happened. Nurses washed the blood off of blood soaked rags and bandages to reuse simply because there was no supply. I don't have to be a doctor to tell you that reusing bandages in a time before antibiotics is a bad idea. It might be better to just not have a bandage in that case at all, as the chance for infection would significantly increase. Dutch, you got any fresh band aids over there? I scraped my knee fight with Micah. Hurts real bad. Maybe get John to kiss my boo boo better. Number two, ancient socks. Somebody got me socks as a gift over the holidays, and let me tell you, Still the best thing you can get. Socks and lip balm, you can do anything you want. Game over. Socks in ancient Greece were not the right and left neon green athletic socks that you have today. No, not even close. Socks came around in the 8th century BC, made fresh from, you guessed it, animal hairs. Yeah, it was gross. This actually led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then tying them up. Cut to the 2nd century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game got real. 
Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins, and it was softer, lighter, and all that jazz. And then later on in the 5th century, socks were worn only by the most holy. Socks were associated with the church, and they were considered a symbol of purity. Yeah, you heard it. Socks would go all the way up to your leg, a little different than the New Balance ones we have now that just go up to your ankle that, you know, fall off when you're halfway to work and then make you really upset. I have one right now, I'm gonna go figure it out. Number one, heavy stomach. We as humans need food and water to live. Water honestly being number one. I mean, I could eat a little bit more, but water's more important. But it is what it is sometimes. People in the past had no choice but to build water pipes out of lead. Sure, maybe it wasn't common knowledge that the lead was toxic, but a lot of people did know. So that's why all the cities that sparked up during the Industrial Revolution were built with such. Lead as a material did make sense, as it was cheap and easy to use. So that simply outweighed the health risk of lead poisoning. Lead was a common material in other products as well. But when your drinking water is supposed to be fresh, maybe it's time to spend a little more so we don't end up, you know, spending a lot more on healthcare for lead poisoning. After years of being underground, the pipes corrode and leak toxins into the water stream. It's why in older cities, a lot of time and money is spent today replacing old pipe infrastructure. To me, it's a classic case of, eh, let somebody else deal with them, sure it's fine. Well, I'm off to go work in a completely safe asbestos factory, I'm sure there's nothing wrong or bad in there. <laughs> Number 10, long neck. Look, this one probably isn't a surprise to anyone. There must be like 20 documentaries on the subject alone, but today we're talking about the long neck women found in some African cultures. In a nutshell, you pile on gold rings around your wife's neck until she's impersonating a totally winnable ring toss game at the county fair. The end result is a neck that's long just as the day is long. Pretty long. And in these cultures, this is considered very beautiful. Now, who am I to judge? I can't. However, as a lawyer, doctor, detective, and fireman here at Bumblebee, I'm gonna not recommend the giraffe look. While at first glance it may look like the neck is being stretched, it's really the shoulders that are being dropped forcibly by having so many rings piled up on your neck. That's just that's not healthy for you. Anyone in the comment section that has played contact sport will tell you that dropping your shoulders like that is not good. I like my thick neck the way it is, thank you very much. Number 9. Lead Cosmetics Did anyone know we still sort of do this today? Are we insane? Lead has been used in makeup for an extremely long time. It was found in cosmetics back in classical antiquity, so that's as far back as the 8th century BC. In the 18th century though, women would mix lead with vinegar to make themselves look more and more pale, which was a beauty standard back in the day. Gotta love looking like you never see the sun. Now, while the white lead that was used wasn't easily absorbed through the skin, the mixture of white lead with other chemicals and ingredients to create makeup and other products did indeed cause lead poisoning. And even though people knew this, they continued to keep on using it? Number 8. Jiggle Machines Oh, the great effort people will go to not make any effort. The self-exercisers or vibration machines were a popular fad back in the 1950s and 60s. The idea? Lose weight fast and easy with the help of modern science and machines. Trouble is, they, they don't really work. At all. In a way, it's pretty similar to the snake oil men of the past. A common issue, a weird solution, and then a great marketing, well, that would make for a fad. Someone had to just make bank on it, I know they did. I mean, I get the appeal, I, I do. I wish I could be a 1950s housewife with a vibration machine, so I could be beach ready. But being a 1950s housewife means I'm so busy. But with a belt machine, it means I can keep my hands free, so I can reach for my favorite brand of menthol cigarettes and my third morning martini. Boy, I sure love this modern world. <sighs> wow. <laughs> Number seven, ear scoops. When I think of all the things I use a scoop for, I think of ice cream and sugar for my tea. Well now, I'm going to be thinking about how people in the Viking era, all the way to the later post-Tudor times, used to scoop out their own earwax. Yes, an ear scoop was a tiny little brass or copper spoon with a twisted handle that went to a point. The spoon part was used for scooping, while the pointed end was used for pooping. No, I just wanted to say that. It was actually used for cleaning the fingernails of dirt. Thanks, ear scoops. Now I'm never going to look at a spoon the same way again. Number six, hangover mask. Okay, picture this. It's 1946. WW2 is over. Life's getting back to normal. You live in a major city, so you decide to take a night on the town with your friends. Well, one too many Manhattans later, and, well, you're not even sure if you're still on the island of Manhattan. You have what the drinkers of the world call a hangover. Let me know in the comments without too much grim detail about your worst hangover. 
What was your poison of choice? I'm curious. Many men and ladies have found themselves in bad places in the morning after uh, so many drinks. Only if there was something to cure said hangover. Well, ladies, you're in luck. The hangover mask aims to cure that. It's basically just a mask with plastic ice cubes. However, I'm gonna get a little personal and say that every hangover I've ever had, I didn't need a face mask. I needed some water and a bucket since the bathroom was too far away. I don't, I don't know why, you're, would your face need to be cold? I don't really understand that part. I don't know. Number five. Shampoo. When my hair grew longer over the pandemic, I had a huge wake up call. I had no idea what I was doing. I only used the guy's shampoo, you know, like the classic four in one shampoos that wasn't working anymore. I needed some curl cream. I needed shampoo and conditioner, separate things. It takes time to figure out what works with your flow, but the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders. They would just dip their hair in cold water at a public bathhouse, also very public, and then rub and scrape oils away. Lime wire was also used to wash your hair back then, but that was horrible. It was just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all. They would just rub their head with bran before bed and then brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. Honestly, guys, I'm not gonna lie. There's something they're not telling us. It was too nice. Number four, aqua tofana. Not to be confused with Aquafina, which is also pretty horrible, Aquatafina was hot in the 17th century. This was a straight up poison that was marketed as a cosmetic. This was during the late 1600s and it was first used by two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofania Di Amato. They used this cosmetic, this makeup, so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. It's named after its creator, a lady named Tefania, who was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through who we believe was her daughter, Yulia Tefana. She took this deadly recipe all the way to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and perhaps belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. This cosmetic took over 600 lives. Brutal. Number three, baldness. So what if you're going bald, but you don't have a massive 16th century stupid wig? Then what do you do? Well, back in those days, if your hair started to thin out or you were losing patches, you would need a mix of chicken droppings. Yeah, chicken mixed with potassium. Okay, this ancient advice comes from a man named Peter Levins. He wrote this method down in 1654 as an alternative to lice-infected wigs. Both sound absolutely horrible. Honestly, I think I'd rather the lice-infected wig. At least then you can just take it off. Number two, sailor's delight. Life on the sea was all but a sea breeze. And even today, you know how hard it is to take a on a boat? Whale watching's fun and games until your stomach decides it's had enough of the sea and wants to go home. While it's a rockin' and rollin' way of using the loo, how did sailors do it back in the day before anything helpful? Was it easier being far away from the general public? Was it helpful that water was all around the place? Honestly, not really. That's when a tow rag comes into play. Yeah, anytime the word rag is used, you're not in for a good time. Near the head of the ship where the toilet was, this little indent or whatever the toilet, it wasn't a toilet, it was a hole, there was a single rope with a rag, and when it wasn't being used, or shared rather, the rag would be tossed over the side of the ship so it would just dangle in the water and wash away all day, which is fine, I think? I'm not really sure. The sharing is caring thing, I'm not on board for, pun intended. Do you fold, do you scrunch, or do you use barnacle rope? How do you do it, guys? Comment down below. Number one, Q-tips. I love Q-tips a lot. I do two at the same time, and then I flip them, and then I do it again. Yeah, I get them twice. The first one for cleanliness, and the second one because it's for me, because I feel like it. Sue me. My eyes roll right back. It's the best. If COVID tests were done through your ear, I'd be getting tested twice a day just for fun. Q-tips, most of us know by now, weren't exactly made for cleaning your ears. As much as we only use them for that, Q-tips were invented in 1923 by a man named Leo Gergenzang after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Sounds a lot like she invented Q-tips, but sure, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. Baby Ray's is like, mm, too close. Sweet Baby Ray's is like, way too close. Our, our sauce is not even close to that product. Back in those days, Q-tips were actually dipped in boric acid first before being shipped out. They were intended to sterilize wounds. After this, there was even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams, Q-cards, whatever, you name it. Anything that made you a QT. Mm. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be used in your ears? Like, sorry, what? What's that all about? Is that real? Well, in 2008, autologist Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax further into your ear canal, leading to possible infections. When Chesbro Pons bought the company in 1962, they added the warning on the box, a warning we all gladly will still ignore, like I said at the beginning. Mm. 
I take one look at my earbuds and I'm like, yeah, I need four Q-tips right away. I need Q-tips yesterday. Number 10, spinning. Two words, chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching Western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like poo, some like brownie green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cups of doors lined the bar. Most of the time, they missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually, because no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti-spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my god, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France. Worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up, perhaps. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. Ah, ha, ha, though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably. I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist, and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. If something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No, I don't wanna ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together, we still do it in like water parks, we swim in pools of pee pee, and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, it's so great, you're like, why did you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so. Boo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archaeology and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized feces show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. Number six, no hand washing. I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals, one run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for 
the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> Considering what we know now, that's rough. Number five, lice. Yes, while we're talking about hair care, why not touch on the subject of lice? It's a problem everywhere, not just in your elementary school. Ancient China had lice problems just like ancient Egypt did. While almost everyone chose the path of baldness in Egypt, it was not so in China. No, other than honey locusts and rice water to clean your hair, one of the common practices to deal with lice was to, um, well, it was to eat the lice that you picked out of your hair. Hey, grub is grub, but I think, uh, I think I'd like to move on from this topic now. Let's, let's go, let's go, let's get the heck out. Number four, poo poo stick. I'm sorry that we have to talk about this, but actually, you know what, I'm not that sorry. Just as it does now, going to drop the kids off at the pool in ancient China left you with the task of cleaning yourself up afterwards. Wiping your bottom, that's what I'm talking about. Now, they did have paper back in ancient China, like we talked about in our ancient Chinese inventions video, but paper was expensive and the only ones who really used it were the emperor and royalty like him who would use straw paper. Before that, and for everyone else, people would use a stick-like tool called a chugi, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, which was basically bamboo strips that were shaped to be thin and flat and slightly wide with rounded edges. Some of these even had great water absorption and a lovely scent. Those who were a bit more fortunate would then wash with water, kind of like an ancient bidet, and then use some good smelling stuff to make it all better. Other than that, a lot of people were cool with using leaves or sticks and stones, and honestly, whatever could do the trick, really. I mean, when you gotta go, you gotta go. Number three, using dirt to clean? Okay, okay, not dirt, but soil. Ancient cultures, including the ancient Chinese, would use soil as a tool in cleaning, which actually had the benefit of being able to help remove oil stains. Now, how did this happen? Apparently, it is believed to be caused by the alkaline qualities of the soil that really helps with the removal of oil. Soil and oil, I did not like that. Which the Chinese actually seem to figure out how to specifically utilize. The Chinese used a kind of natural alkali to clean their clothes, which evolved to be scented to help keep the clothes nice and funky smelling. The use of this stuff was so popular that there were tons of scented alkali stores that opened up around China, with some even becoming pretty famous. Maybe not unusual, but definitely very interesting and a precursor to modern laundry soaps, so, hmm. Number two, water purification. While this may be considered more of a health thing than a hygiene thing, I mean, I'd argue that hygiene is health, so get at me. <laughs> the ancient Chinese discovered and made extensive use of groundwater for drinking, and they kept record of how they would keep their wells and well water nice and clean. The construction of the wells was pretty important, with the bottom of the wells regularly being dredged to keep the water clean. The inner walls of the wells were reinforced with ceramic bricks and tiles to stop that pesky soil and other impurities from falling into the water, and the openings of the wells were covered to safeguard against contamination from above the ground. The cleaning of wells was even institutionalized as a feast in some places. So cleaner water and food, it's a win-win. Knowing early on that drinking water could make them pretty sick, the Chinese boiled their water and allowed the sediment to settle before using it for cooking and drinking. They also knew what was up with water. They just knew what was up in general. It's pretty great. Okay, let's move on. I'm talking too much. Number one, no stink. Smelling funky fresh and clean was all the rage, as it should be today too. I ain't trying to be on the subway with a nose full of body odor, just as I wouldn't wish to submit anyone else to that. Th to be fair, not everyone knows they stanky and some people don't get a choice, but back in ancient China, those who were wealthy enough would spice up their weekly baths with roots, flowers, peppers, ginger, and all that yummy smelling goodness to basically create a lovely smelling cleansing soup to plop themselves into. Women would also carry around aromatic pouches that would just keep a nice smell around them at all times. Those who were not as wealthy would have to find other means to keep things fresh though. One that I'm not too sure would actually help smell-wise was applying their own pee-pee to their pits once a year on New Year's. This was done as a kind of a disinfectant. But like I said, I'm, I'm not too sure about this one, but if anyone has the knowledge, uh, first-hand or otherwise, keep it to yourself, uh, let me know, like down in the comments. I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Kicking off the list at number 10. Wiper, no wiping. On part three of the series, we of course brought up the worst job in royal history, the groom of the stool. Wiping was a royalty. We didn't have the fluffy bear family telling us to hashtag enjoy the go, 
where they used an incredible amount, just a wasteful amount of toilet paper. Those bears, so wasteful. We had to improvise back then and use leaves. And by we, I mean medieval peasants, not us. We discussed Romans just pooping through cold cement benches, but what did they use to wipe after the fact? Well, that was the sponge on the stick method, which I'll be honest, that's my favorite of the ancient methods. Cause you know somebody had the perfect stick, right? Like one that was like, hm, hm, just the perfect angle to really get in there. No, the sponge on the stick wasn't that fun at all. It was actually communal, it was all bad. You had to share it, be like, oh, okay. Here you go, sir. Early Americans used brick-lined pits, and that was their washrooms. This was around the time of the Declaration of Independence, and besides human waste, people would dump anything in these toilets. They found a window in one of these pits. A window. Some poor guy in a window. Can you believe that? And as for wiping, are you ready? Dried corn on the cob, that's what they would use. Yeah, man, next time you do that corn on the cob butter trick where you like spin it through the butter, all nice and smooth, keep that in mind. Number nine, just pull it. We've talked about brushing your teeth with urine, we've talked about using horsehair for dental floss, but can it get even more bizarre when it comes to oral cleanliness? Yes. We still do this method today. If a tooth is beyond repair or it's causing an infection in your jaw, yeah, just pull that sucker out. See ya. Sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes. Back in the day though, this was the best and only method. Sore tooth, maybe a cavity, something's not feeling right, maybe your gums are just hurting, maybe you bit down on a bone, no problem. Pull it, no matter what the case is, just <laughs> yank it out. Dentists weren't a thing in the Middle Ages. Dr. Downer didn't politely remind you to floss more, you know what I'm saying? But they did have a barber, the fastest dentist in the game. Barbers are responsible for obviously cutting hair, but they too would pull teeth and they would bloodlet. This guy must have been in the weeds every single day. He was so busy. Yeah, just a little off the top, maybe a little bit of blood at this, a couple of molars too, classic three in one appointment, you're good, debit. If you walked into the barber shop and you were bald, he already knew what was up. He was like, all right, I'm gonna start warming up the arm here. And if you think that's weird, well, let's go a little bit more recent for this one. Number eight, doormat toothpaste. We've mentioned some horrible lipsticks and face powders, so we need to mention this disaster of a brand. Moving past the days where your barber pulls out the problem in the 1940s, we had toothpaste. Yes, we had it, this is good. In fact, we had the most powerful toothpaste ever to this day. It was called Doramad. Okay, yeah, so back in the 40s, people were brushing with radiation. Even on the actual tube, it says, radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Okay. These cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is hindered and they're destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant, mild, refreshing taste. Ah, yummy. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but the fact that this existed once, not too long ago, is just wild to me. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. What would their slogan be today? Doramad, accelerate your breath. Number seven, shards and shards. Oh, you thought we were done with the bum bum history. I think again. This is a part four, and honestly, I can do four more parts on wiping alone. It's a pretty big deal, it's nuts. We don't realize how lucky we are. During the pandemic, for example, one of the first things people stocked up on was toilet paper. It's worrisome to not have six rolls on standby. You start getting anxious, right? You're like, oh, but what if I eat some lobster? I don't know, whatever makes your tummy upset. Now you know a little bit more about me. But nobody did it like the ancient Greeks, and I mean nobody. Survey says ancient Greeks would wipe using broken pieces of ceramic. Oh my God. They would even sometimes write the names of their enemas, I mean enemies, on this piece of shard and then wipe. Isn't that wild? It's like, ah, I'll show you by wiping with ceramic with your name on it. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, this obviously led to major health problems and according to the British medical journals, three pieces was often enough. Three is still a good number today. That's a comfortable fold, but ceramic, no, there's no way. No way. It was the better alternative, believe it or not. The other was actually sharp seashells. Number six, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was even born, what did people do to smell good? What? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. Nothing like speed stick at all. Not even close to being discreet. You can't put the stuff on the bus. It's not, they're gonna, what's that guy doing with that jar of goop? Ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs when it came to ancient deodorant. They made perfumes and were amongst the first to try any type of deodorant. So thank you. Thank you. Hence the ostrich egg factor. Mixing a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shells, nuts, and then bam, you're ready for the day. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. Egyptians would also use porridge balls. Flavored porridge rolled up and then safely secured in your little apple pitter fritters right there. Just don't wave at anybody or else you'll, there you go. Number five, tooth removal. Here, I found this quote from a dentist in the medieval period who would travel from town to town. 
Take some newts, buy some cold lizards, and those nasty beetles which are found in fens during the summertime. Calcine them in an iron pot and make a powder thereof. Wet the forefinger of the right hand, insert it in the powder, and apply to the tooth frequently, refraining from spitting it off. When the tooth will fall away without pain, it is proven. Hey, if it is proven, who am I to say otherwise? Just some lowly YouTube host. If you weren't using your Newton Beetle powder to remove your tooth, then it looks like you're going the much more old-fashioned tooth pulling route. And that was much, much worse. They had rudimentary anesthetics that was possibly used then, but you had to worry about bleeding and infection. I think I'll stick with my uh, Beetle Newt powder. Number four, Rejuvenique mask. I got another mask for you guys, I know, but I saw this and I, I just didn't know what to think, honestly. It's a mask that you wear, but it's plugged into a battery pack and it sends pulsations to your face. After, of course, you've applied the toning gel. What the heck is toning gel? I don't know. This is supposed to tone your face, apparently. Your jawline, or I just feel like plunging your face into a mask that's hooked up to a voltage. Uh, that's, a, that's just a bad idea. Oh, yeah, and also a bad idea is the mask itself. Look at this thing. I mean, that's a heinous looking mask right there. You can come home from school one day, and your mom's gonna be sitting at the kitchen table looking up Michael Myers. Oh, that's not okay. Please don't do horror movie beauty stuff, ladies. Please, no. I don't wanna be scared. I don't like scary stuff. Number three, Spit Black. Back in the roaring 20s, they had mascara, just like we do now. But unlike the little tubes of stuff we have, they had a block or cake of the stuff. To get it to a state where they could actually apply it to their lashes, they would need to add water. And what's the quickest form of water? That's right, it's your spit. The mascara cake stuff was made of soap and coloring, which you don't really want to put near your eyes. But then, knowing that people are using their spit to apply it, it's your own spit, so I guess if you're comfortable with that, you do you, pal, but it makes me think of dudes using their saliva to like lick their eyebrows. Ick. Number two, sharp teeth. I like Shark Boy and Lava Girl just as much as the next guy. However, that doesn't mean I want to look and feel like a shark. This one just creeps me out. I, I, I don't hate a dentist, but I think everyone can agree with me that teeth getting drilled is just uncomfortable. It just kind of sucks. Especially if there's like powdered tooth in your mouth. That's just the worst. It's kind of gross too. I don't know. Well, what I do know, however, is that there are some cultures out there where the ladies get their teeth sharpened or filed. Oh yes, and there ain't no dentist office there either. This is bite the leather, you're in dad's kitchen kind of operation. Oh God. I would honestly talk more about it, but the editor's gonna show some pictures and I'm gonna have to stop because if I see him, I would get queasy. I don't wanna see that stuff. I, I, no thank you, no teeth sharp. No, no. Number one, mercury laced skin cream. Secure Gorad's Oriental Cream and take your first step to a new lasting beauty. That's right, over time you too can develop dark rings around your eyes, lose some of those pearly whites, and get stunning black gums. That's because Gorad's Oriental Cream is made with calomel. What is calomel I hear you ask? It's a mercury compound. Yeah, it doesn't sound so good anymore, does it? While the women of the 1920s who used this product, maybe once or twice, would be fine, those who used it over long periods of time subjected themselves to mercury poisoning. But hey, Gorad's cream came in white, flesh, and whatever the hell color Rachel is supposed to be. 